I've been recording a series of discussions on the theme of rivers and water. We looked at the river that refreshes God's people from Psalm 46. And last week we looked at the uh, river that uh, feeds the roots of trees. Some trees grow in rock. Some trees grow by the river, the river giants. And uh, I talked about choosing what sorts of information and outlook uh, comes into our lives and makes us the people that we are. And how important it is to tap into God's river and let that shape who we are. There are so many ways we could explore this theme of living spiritual lives today using the theme of water. And I want to look at Ezekiel 47. This is one of the classic scriptures that talks about this theme. Now Ezekiel, sometimes prophecies undergo major revisions. You know, like the Old Testament prophets imagined how God would restore the world and what the new creation and the end times would look like. But nobody expected Jesus to be exactly the way he was. When he came, so many of the things that they'd written were reinterpreted and took on a fresh look because of who Jesus was and what he revealed. So when we read Old Testament prophecies today, we need to read them through that lens. And Ezekiel, in his vision of how the world would be set right, he was a priest and he thought about God restoring the temple and reinstating the priests and the sacrifices and making Israel a holy land forever. But Jesus replaced the temple with the body of Christ. He declared that all his followers were priests and kings and there wasn't any need for a caste of priests. And he did away with sacrifices by being the last perfect sacrifice himself. But Ezekiel, Ezekiel's sacrifice prophecies are still important because they evoke some very powerful symbols that are vital to God's dream for thriving on this planet. We need to know with Ezekiel that God is continuing his creation project to bring order out of chaos. That's one of the things Ezekiel loved to see. And that God longs to dwell with humans when the issues of atonement and reconciliation have been sorted. Then the man took me back to the door of the temple. I saw water flowing from under the entrance of the temple towards the east. The temple faced east. The water was flowing under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. Then he led me through a north gate and around to the outer east gate. The water was flowing down the south side of the gate. With a measuring line in his hands, the man went eastward. He measured off 1,500 feet and led me through the water. The water came up to my ankles. Then he measured off another 1,500 feet and led me through the water. The water came up to my knees. He measured off another 1,500 feet and led me through the water. The water came up to my waist. Then he measured another 1,500 feet. But the water had ridden so much that it became a river which I couldn't cross. The river was too deep to cross except by swimming. Then he asked me, Son of man, do you see this? Then the man led me back along the bank of the river. As I went back, I saw many trees on both sides of the river. Then the man said to me, This water flows through the land to the east down into the Jordan Valley and into the Dead Sea. When the water flows into the Dead Sea, it will replace the salt water there with fresh water. Wherever the river flows, there'll be many fish and animals. The river will make the water in the Dead Sea fresh. Wherever the river flows, it will bring life. From En Gedi to Eglaim, people will be standing on the shore of the sea with their fishing nets spread out. As many kinds of fish will be there as there are in the Mediterranean Sea, but the water in the swamps and marshes won't become fresh. It will remain as a source of salt. All kinds of fruit trees will grow on both sides of the river. 
Their leaves won't wither and they won't fail to produce fruit. Each month they will produce fresh fruit because this water flows from the holy place. The fruit will be good food and the leaves will be used for healing. This is a wonderful image of a flood. This lake was completely empty yesterday. It's only filled up overnight with all the rain we've had. And uh, you can see the water's come in from the road over here. And when it first comes in, of course it's shallow. It's only ankle deep here. This is only shallow. And then it gets deeper and deeper. You go in there, of course, and it's, it's very deep. It wouldn't be over your head, but certainly you'd have to swim. And that's exactly what Ezekiel's talking about in his river. It starts off out of the sanctuary and then it flows out. And after a thousand cubits, or a long distance, the angel or the messenger leads him into the water and it's ankle deep. It goes another thousand cubits and it's up to his knees. Another thousand up to his waist. And then another thousand, he says, the only way you can survive now is to swim. And if the river is an image of the life of God flowing out of the sanctuary, to bless the land and to bring blessing and fertility and fruitfulness, then of course it's a wonderful image that at times when we, we get into the flow of life, it's only up to our ankles. But as we go deeper, the flow becomes stronger and the effect is more profound. It's a wonderful image that uh, Ezekiel's given to us here of the river of life flowing. And we need to gradually get deeper and deeper into it until we're over our heads. Ezekiel talks about this river that flows from the temple, flows out through the land and gradually gets deeper until it flows down to the Jordan Valley and down to the Dead Sea. What's the source of this river? Well for this river here we have today which is in flood. It comes from the hills of Tulangi and comes down picking up all the tributaries and the rain running off the paddocks and makes this flood that we have here today. But for Ezekiel, the rain is not even present. It comes out of the life of the temple. It's a symbol of the life of God and of blessing flowing through the land. So the source is God's, God himself. God is the source of vitality and blessing in the river that Ezekiel talks about. The course of the river once it leaves the sanctuary it goes through dry and barren land and everywhere it goes it brings refreshing and then the force of the river as the river flows it washes all before it it brings new life in uh, our country floods are very important to flush the salt out of the land and take it out to the sea they bring freshness and vitality. Too much, of course, can also drown things. But you need flood water. We need a flood here. It makes all the frogs and the birds and the fish and the insects. It's a great blessing. They bring life and abundance, which feeds a whole ecosystem. And that's what this image of Ezekiel is, of a river that comes and flows through the land and brings vitality and fruitfulness and blessing wherever it goes.
So what does this all mean? This powerful image from Ezekiel 47 about a river. And uh, I, I think I just want to spend a few moments thinking about it and what it really means. First of all, it shows the need for spirit. It's a bit similar to a, a vision that Ezekiel had earlier about the valley of the dry bones where God strung all the bones together and even put flesh on them and they had a mighty army but it had no life until the Spirit of God came in the breath and filled them with spirit. And I think this is the same thing. Ezekiel's just been talking for a couple of chapters about restoring the temple and restoring the priesthood and getting all the sacrifices right. But if there's no river of life flowing out of the temple, then it's all dead and meaningless. It's just a bunch of rituals and rules. It doesn't have without spirit, it doesn't have life. So I think he's getting onto that same kind of thing. And you, you can be, you can do that with your life. You know, we need to have a we spend the first part of our lives building the container. We get ourselves fit, we learn things, we um, develop skills. But unless we have the spirit of life, we haven't really learned to live. And you can be in a perfect church. You can be beautifully organized, have great personnel and great um, rituals and great routines. And everything, all the administration is done perfectly. The building's wonderful. But if the spirit of life isn't there, you know it's dead, of course. And it's the same thing with our own selves. We need to be alive to the spirit of God. We need to let God enter our life so we have a spiritual connection. And the second thing I think about in this river, you know, this progress from going ankle deep through to very deep, waist, you know, knees, then waist, and then fully immersed, is kind of a mythic quality about that, isn't there? You know, like, you know, when you start your spiritual life, you know, you, you first become a Christian, you, you're happy like a child splashing through puddles. And then you start to get more involved and you begin to you know, join the fellowship and get involved in church and that sort of thing, and you begin to get more immersed in the life of, the, of God's people, and it's terrific. But when you get really old, like me, then you begin to look back and you say, you know, you maybe even not be so sure you're footing anymore, you're swimming, but you've learned to trust the river. You've learned to trust God. I hope that's the case. And, and that as you move on in life, perhaps sometimes... It gets harder to keep your footing, but you learn to trust. You learn that you need to um, all the more find who God is and put trust and faith in him. You may not have all the answers, but you learn contentment. Now, and the third thing I think about it with this river is the progress not just from um, shallow to deep, but from death to life, from, from dryness to fertility, from salty to fresh. You know, th this river... In the geography of Palestine, it runs right through some of the most barren country in all of Judea. It, uh, the b b journey from Jerusalem down to the Jordan Valley, I, I went there in a taxi once, and it was just so dry and barren and, uh, and a wilderness. That's all it was. And yet in this image, that's exactly where the river runs. And as he goes through, it's interesting, after he's been swimming, it says he looks back. And he sees, now there are trees on all sides of the river. Well, there's no trees there, I tell you. It's just rocks. But in the vision, the life that comes from the river leads to fertility and fruitfulness. And everything becomes alive. And when, he, when the river finally gets through to the Dead Sea, uh, it makes that come alive as well. Now, the Dead Sea is the deadest place on Earth. It's the lowest place on planet Earth. It's actually so far below sea level and all the water runs into it and it's got nowhere to go. So it evaporates and leaves all the salt behind. That's why it's such a salty, salty place. No fish can live in that or no, nothing can live in there very much at all. And uh, people harvest the salt for commercial purposes. It's very, you know, it's very rich in minerals. And it's, But in this vision that Ezekiel has, when the river of life flows into the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea becomes alive. It becomes fresh. There's fish, as many kinds as there are in the Mediterranean, it says in the text. Um, but interestingly, he says, but you'll notice there's still, there's still salt in the marshes, so people can still harvest salt for the purposes they need it for. I think that's interesting. He knows that salt has some use. He doesn't want to see it all gone away. Maybe there's a meaning in that too. I think as you look back through life, you do see that 
you have been fruitful, I hope. I hope you can look back and see that your life has counted. Sometimes it, you know, it's not easy to see. <clears throat> but I hope that you, um, you can look back and feel that you know, sometimes even though you felt mighty dry, and the prayer is, O oh Lord, send my roots rain. I hope you can see that God has fulfilled his promises and that God has enabled you to see some fruitfulness in some of, of the abundant life that's promised to us as we trust in Jesus. And then as we think about going towards the Dead Sea, towards the Sea of Death, you know, maybe that's not quite so scary for the Christian anymore because we're trusting that the life of God will even make that experience of death something that isn't quite so fearful. There's eternal life caught up in that as well. The river of God's life brings many to all our struggles. And there's still some salt left, he says. And there's still some difficulties and some suffering and some loss and some struggle. Without them, there'd be no life at all. But the river of life makes it bearable. So I guess the message is, trust yourself to the river. Find the river of God. It flows inside of you. It flows from the scriptures. God is at work in our communities. Get in line with the river and find out what God wants you to do. And if you're over your head, that's okay. The river will carry you. Trust the river. Next week, I want to talk about how John, the author of Revelation, takes Ezekiel's image of the river and redirects it. And you might like to read Revelation 22 and think about that for yourself. Next week, of course, is Mother's Day. And also, it is the 10th of May. That's, that's our wedding anniversary. 40 years we'll have been married, and we'll be celebrating that too on that day. May God bless you. Let's pray together. God, send your river of life through our hearts, through our lives, through us into the community in which we live. May our churches be fruitful. May our own lives be fertile and abundant. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit will take us up and take us, teach us the, the ways of God and show us how we should live in this world. We ask your blessing in the name of Jesus who died for us. Amen. There's a river running deep within the silence of our souls. Where the quenching healing waters carve their heart At its sources spring of living water Searching and sustained It's the voice of Jesus waiting for the listening in our hearts Thank you.